So look at that. Awesome. I kind of feel with the background or ambient music that we might turn this into a bit of a karaoke party. <laughs> so uh, if I run out of things to say, uh, thank you Aziza for your kind words and thank you for all coming tonight. I know there's a few friends in the room who told me they bought tickets so they're actually garnering a favor yet to come. Uh, I'm talking about you, Wayne Matsu and Rosemary back there. Marcello Cabezas and uh, actually Jenny Green from the Toronto Arts Council. Jenny, why don't you wait for good people? So if you're looking for funding from the Toronto Arts Council, Jenny's the one to talk to tonight. So uh, it's my pleasure to be here. I have brought a USB key with a little presentation for you, but we don't have a laptop. So rather than holding up the USB key and telling you about that, I'll just improvise in terms of what I'm, uh, what I'm saying to you. Uh, I'm not going to talk about Russia and Ukraine, you've heard enough about that. Uh, we stand by the decision we made, and we made it not because of politics, not because of donor pressure, not because of government intervention, but because of human denigration. We do not feel that we should choose our stage, our stage at the Toronto Symphony to allow an artist who uses their online artistic platform to share uh, hurtful words and offensive words about other groups of people and respect of who they might be. So that's our position, we stand by it, you've heard about it, enough said. In terms of our social context in the city of Toronto, um, we, as you all know, live in one of the world's most ethnically diverse cities. We're living in a period of radical change. For those of you that uh, might be paying attention to what Stephen Hawking has been talking about in terms of what might be coming for our economy, and uh, artificial intelligence and so on, the role of imagination, of human empathy, of creativity is going to become much more front and center as we move our society forward. We in Toronto love the idea of creative economies, so much so that we actually moved Richard Florida here from the University of Chicago. So Richard's theory, as you say, I won't paraphrase it uh, well enough for him, but really is that you can look at successful cities and there are strong creative indicators attached to those creative regions that seem to suggest that that creativity led directly to economic success. We have been engaged in Canada in a very broad policy discussion, starting with the Massey Commission between 1949 and 1951, where we decided as a country we would create things like the Canada Council for the Arts, we would increase our investment in things like the CDC to show Europe that we were not a lumberjack nation, that we were about something more than uh, natural resources. Um, as such, we copied European arts models and built those all across the country. We then moved into a city building agenda where we created inter-municipal uh, competitions between various cities in terms of who had an opera company, who didn't, we all need one, we all need the symphony, and so on. That led to radical cultural growth across the country. And then we entered the sort of creative economy discussion, which really is about uh, culture's role in driving economic development, tourism, etc. Which is of course all true, but for 60 years we basically used culture and investment in culture to build a sense of national brand, municipal brand, and economic development without ever having a broader conversation about culture's roles in our lives. So most Canadians actually fundamentally do not understand the role of creativity and culture. And in fact, I talk to many Canadians who say, I don't like classical music, classical music isn't for me. And then if you follow up with the question, well, when's the last time you came to the Toronto Symphony or have you ever been? They have not. Um, earlier today I said, it's kind of like when you have a small child, and that small child, before they even try the food, says, I don't like that food. Uh, many, many people do not feel that they are part of our cultural community or welcome there, and we need to sort of adjust that kind of framework. In terms of uh, further on the Toronto side of things, we have spent two and a half billion dollars on cultural infrastructure in the last 16 years in the city of Toronto. If you, and that basically was the Superbelt Project, OCAD, uh, TIFF Bell Lightbox, uh, the investments down the distillery district, and so on. Um, good thing about that is we got a lot of architectural infrastructure for the arts that is at a much higher level than what we had before. The bad news is every time you build a building, the operating cost for those buildings increase, and as such, we're actually not doing much differently than before we made that two and a half billion dollar investment. So there's a real opportunity for us now in Toronto to say, now that we have upgraded infrastructure, what do we do in terms of differentiating Toronto on the world stage? And that's very critical for us as we move forward. 
In terms of the role creativity might play in society, you probably know in the same period that we invested or increased our investment by this two and a half billion dollars, we dropped from having public school music teachers in 60% of our public schools to the current level of 18%. So fewer than one in five schools in Toronto has a music teacher. So we've talked a lot about creative class, the importance of creative economies, and so on. And yet in that whole period, we've undermined our own capacity to build that creativity within our own children and young people. So the context is, not to be too depressing, um, great cultural diversity, great creative diversity in the city of Toronto, great cultural infrastructure on the asset side. On the negative side, a bit of an underinvestment in the things that truly make young people extraordinary and for society extraordinary and so on.